You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 29. Hi there everyone, it's Gavin Weber and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Well, welcome to another episode. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this, what has become a, a very interesting, well I think it's interesting anyway, but I'm the one doing all the talking, an interesting che- cheese making podcast. So well, what's been happening in my cheese making world? So I gave a presentation to a crowd of about, I think it was about 30 people at the Ivanhoe Library. And Ivanhoe is in the, in the north northeast part of Melbourne, not too far out of the city. And uh, it was on the 22nd of August. Uh, sorry, 22nd of July. What am I talking about? 22nd of July. And the presentation went for about an hour and 15 minutes. And I really enjoyed presenting it. I had a slideshow, and then um, halfway through that, I uh, showed a whole bunch of cheesemaking equipment that I've that I've got. You know, stuff that a a home cheesemaker would normally use, like uh, the press, um, hoops uh, for uh, things like camembert and brie for for those sort of mold ripened cheeses, and uh, the spoons and all that sort of stuff, and the pot and all the stuff you can readily get um, at home in your in your in your kitchen. Uh, and then uh, once I um, showed all that, a bit of a show and tell, I then showed people how to make mozzarella. Um, and unfortunately, in a library, it's pretty hard to do that. So I played my uh, mozzarella, a uh, quick mozzarella video tutorial and stepped people through that because there's no there's no narrative track in that video. So um, I stepped people through that and I think they enjoyed that. And then we had enough time, thank goodness, that we, uh, I managed to show the cream cheese making video, which I do talk through and do narrate. And both of those videos are available on YouTube under the username Greening of Gavin. So that was really interesting. And then uh, this weekend that's just passed, uh, I taught a cheese making workshop at Hillside, which is to the north of the city of Melbourne. And uh, for me, it's about... 20 minutes drive away. It's not very far at all. I think it's about uh, 25 kilometres. So I uh, taught six lovely ladies how to make ricotta. That was a demonstration and I showed them uh, Gavin's special smooth ricotta version, uh, which I'll put a link in the show notes for anybody who's interested. And I'll tell you what, it made the creamiest ricotta you ever did taste. Um, And we're going to use that in a ricotta tart that my wife Kim is going to make. So that should be very nice. It's kind of like a baked cheesecake, if anybody's made something like that. And then the uh, the six uh, ladies then uh, made their own mozzarella after I stepped them through the process, and they all went away successfully with lots of um, mozzarella, and uh, they were very surprised uh, on how wonderful it taste, uh, tasted, and that they actually have now become curd nerds, and I managed to sell uh, a little bit of equipment uh, to those ladies, and uh, they they thank me for that, and um, and thank me for teaching the the cheese making course. And of course, Kim was in the background there washing stuff up and uh, and that sort of thing. And the ladies washed their own pots and pans, which they bought themselves. So that's kind of been what's happening in my uh, my cheese making world. Um, we do have another cheese making course coming up. In August, and the details of that are on the uh, the cheese making uh, blog, Little Green Cheese. And uh, you just go and click on Cheese Making Courses, and you'll go through to my business website, which is Little Green Workshops. The main topic we're going to talk about today is rennet, because I had lots of questions about rennet at the cheese making course, and there are. Two main types of rennet, but both contain the same, the same coagulant, and that's what rennet basically does. It originally it came from um, from animal parts. So rennet comes from the fourth stomach of an unweaned calf, and back in the old days, it used to be called the rennet bag or the vel, uh, and the 
uh, around the lining of the stomach lives this enzyme called uh, chymosin. That's spelled C H Y M O S I N. Another enzyme called pepsin, spelled P E P S I N. Uh, now, new- newborn calves have about 95% chymosin uh, and 5% pepsin. And what this does is this enzyme chymosin, the, the main one, it coagulates milk. Um, so it sets the, the the milk itself into a solid, and then when you cut what's then known as the curds, um, it releases the whey, which is the the uh, the non-solid, the the liquid. So it comes in. Um, uh, uh, so calf based um, rennet obviously doesn't allow for some some diets like you know vegetarians and vegans, and some other religious diets. So what they've had to come up with is to develop a vegetable-based version of chymosin. And they've done that using, using genetic engineering, basically. However, they've kind of said that it's not. What they've done, it's known as the fermentation method. So around 1990, um, scientists have used, used a gene um, from a calf cell uh, for, for chymosin and inserted it into the gene of um, certain bacterias and yeasts. And these microbes then replic- replicate and grow rapidly uh, and can be grown continuously and make an exact copy of the calf uh, chymosin. So really they, they say it's not, um, they argue that it's not genetically uh, modified um, it's not genetically engineered because nothing's changed. The gene is just replicated in a plant instead of a calf's stomach. Uh, now most, and this is this is labelled and branded as vegetarian rennet, so um, nothing had to be killed, obviously, except obviously the initial gene. So nothing had to be killed to make a vegetarian rennet. And approximately 70% of all cheeses made throughout the world now are coagulated using uh, the fermentation chymosin from bacteria and yeast. Uh, so they are, in fact, a vegetarian cheese. So now, personally, I don't use um, calf rennet. I'm not sure I could kill a baby animal to, um, to coagulate my milk. Um, however, purists out there would argue that the animal rennet is more authentic in taste and... They would also argue that vegetarian rennet may leave a bitter aftertaste. Now, I never find that with any of my cheeses, so I'll stick to the vegetarian rennet. Um, I'm not a vegetarian myself. Um, I'm more of a um, sustainability guy, so I will buy organic meats, uh, biodynamic meats and stuff like that, but we eat meat very sparingly anyway. So I'll stick to vegetarian rennet, but uh, but out there there is uh, indeed... Um, the market for animal rennet. That's the the two basic types of rennet. Now, I'm also going to have a quick chat about another enzyme, which is also from uh, derived from an animal, but starting to um, re- more recently uh, being derived from uh, vegetarian means, and that is lipase. Uh, it's pronounced a couple of ways. Well, I, I pronounce it lipase. I think in the US it's called lipase. So uh, it's actually alive and living in raw milk normally. Uh, it's one of the enzymes that are present uh, in, in raw milk, and it actually gets killed uh, when milk is pasteurised. Now, what, M's, uh, what lipi- lipase does, it breaks down the fat globules within the, the milk and re- releases fatty acids. Uh, and what this does, it... Uh, uh, over time, when your cheese is ripening, it gradually increases the piquant flavour of the cheese uh, and also makes the texture of the cheese smoother and, and more velvety. And you'll find that in such cheeses as uh, as Parmesan. Um, some Parmesans have uh, lipase added to them. Uh, feta definitely has, has lipase added to it, as well as... Quite a few other Italian sorts of cheeses. So where do they get the uh, the lipase from? Well, this may be a bit of a shock to some people, but it's actually from 
uh, the tongue and stomach. So it's from the tongue glands of calves, kids, and lambs. On most packets, it'll say pre-gastric enzymes. I know on the lipase that uh, that I use, um, it it had that, and that I now buy vegetarian uh, lipase, uh, which is a, a microbial lipase, uh, very similar to what vegetarian rennet is, uh, made in the same sort of method. So that's a that's a pure vegetarian lipase as well. So it flavors your milk. Um, you shouldn't um, you shouldn't add too much lipase because it happens. It it's not you don't add more lipase to get more flavor. If you know what I mean, it's it's the action of the lipase on the the fatty acids that uh, that cause the flavor. It's not the amount of lipase. So it's all about the way you ripen your cheese, uh, how long you leave it for, on on what type of activity uh, the lipase does. Just make sure that. Before you add your lipase to your milk, it, it's normally added um, before the milk starts to coagulate, but after the lactic acid formation has happened. So you add it in between the starter culture and the rennet. So um, it just needs to get in there to, to start doing its stuff. So if you're using raw milk and you and you happen to be able to Get a source of raw milk. You probably won't need to use lipase at all because it's present in that milk already. Anyway, so that's the different types of rennet and lipase, and I hope that's brought a little bit of light on where these uh, two enzymes that are essential in um, in some cheeses, rennet especially most um, semi-hard and hard cheeses, but lipase is is um, something that's uh, to your personal taste. Just another thing on, on lipase, if you use goat's milk, there's a higher content of lipase in goat's milk than there is in cow's milk. So uh, you know, you may not need to add lipase if you're making a goat's milk feta, for instance. Uh, that tartiness or a piquant flavour will, will uh, exhibit itself as the cheese ages. So, like I said, I hope you've uh, learned a little bit about rennet and lipase and and where they come from. And just uh, be aware that uh, if you're on a vegetarian diet and you're trying to make a vegetarian-style cheese, obviously you're still going to be using milk, but look for vegetarian rennet, and if you can get your hands on it, vegetarian lipase as well. well I don't have any uh, voicemails this week, and I couldn't find a half-decent news uh, segment to uh, to talk about or to play. Um, so if anybody's got any voice messages uh, that they would like to leave me, any questions about uh, home cheese making, don't forget you can do that over on the Little Green Cheese blog. Uh, there's a widget on the sidebar, so it's littlegreencheese.com and it's there's a little widget on the right-hand side that says leave me a message. Alternatively, you can go to speakpipe.com slash gavin spelled G-A-V-I-N underscore Weber, W-E-B-B-E-R, and you can leave me a message there as well. But I do have lots of email questions. So we'll start off. This one's from Jeremy. Jeremy comes from Massachusetts in the US. Uh, He says, good morning. I began brewing beer over a year ago. Uh, When I first started reading this, I thought it was about beer making. I don't do a beer making podcast, but it's a good idea. (laughs) I might start one. Uh, anyway, sorry, back to Jeremy. Um, I began brewing beer over a year ago and decided I might try to make other items by hand as well. Cheese was my next logical step. I recently produced a four pound wheel of high moisture cheddar and I've attached some photos. And uh, yeah, the cheeses look very nice, Jeremy. Uh, well done. Uh, he has two questions for me. Uh, I would like to know if a natural rind method can be applied to most hard cheese styles or if some cheeses are just meant for waxing. All right, so in answer to that question, uh, yeah, most uh, most hard cheeses can be naturally rind, um, can have a natural rind. Uh, you don't necessarily have to uh, wax or vacuum pack. But for the home cheese maker, because we're making such small quantities of cheese, uh, if you have a natural rind and you maintain that rind by wiping it with a, with brine, um, 
you will find that your cheeses dry out a lot quicker, especially if you're trying to make a, um, say, a mature cheddar or something like that that's going to age for quite a while. If you've only got one to two kilograms, which would be two to four pounds of cheese, you will find out that if you're trying to age it for a year, it's going to dry out um, during that year and you're going to have a hard lump of cheese. My preference, and, and this is just through experience, that you uh, wax your cheese. If you're going to try and make an, a, a long-aged cheese, then you should wax it. However, with that said, if you can make a very large batch, and this leads to uh, to Jeremy's second question, which I'll just say now. Uh, my second question is, do the dimensions of the final cheese make a huge impact on drying, aging, or flavour of the cheese? Uh, these are two items that are causing my research frustration lately. Uh, okay, to answer your second question there, Jeremy, uh, yeah, the, the larger the cheese, the less prone to drying out it is, uh, and it will the rind will, um, because of the larger volume, the larger area, it won't dry out as quickly. Aging, I'm not so sure of. Uh, I think um, the cheese will age depending on how you've made it. It's the recipe and the size of the curds that will determine um, not only that, but the flavour and how much salt you've added as well, um, and all these variables um, that happen. So the size of the cheese does have an impact on how moist the cheese will, will stay during the ageing process. So thanks very much for your question, Jeremy. Okay, the next one is from Kylie. And uh, Kylie left this comment on, on the blog under the um, episode 28. Uh, which was titled Salt's Function in Cheesemaking. Uh, Kylie says, Hi Gavin, I have I have just bought myself a cheesemaking kit because I'm curious about it, uh, but I also try to live a green-tinged life and I would like to think that making cheese reduces my environmental impact. Thing is, I am struggling to see how it does. Don't I just take the transportation and production impacts away from a corporation. I'm wondering if I have explained that somewhere. Oh, I'm wondering if you have explained that somewhere and could you give me a link or a very brief explanation here? Well, a lot of people that make... Oh, thanks for your question, Kylie. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm jumping straight into the question. A lot of people would argue that a lot of home cheese makers maintain their own maintain their own herd, that whether they have a, a house goat or a house cow, they're the one in charge of the production of the milk from that animal. And uh, more often than not, nothing gets wasted. So when you have your own dairy producing animal, you tend not to waste anything. Insofar as a big commercial dairies, they do waste a lot of product. Uh, and it all depends on whether it's become contaminated. And I've read um, recently that uh, one dairy farm, I think it was in the US, dumped uh, a whole day's worth of milk into a river and that contaminated the river and killed all the fish. So fish don't live in milk, um, <laughs> which is probably quite obvious. And also, as far as that environmental impact goes, you've got to look at a, a larger herd size or a commercial dairy um, has a lot of manure that they have to get rid of. Now, a lot of them are, are actually becoming quite environmentally aware and they put the, put the uh, manure into methane digesters and they generate electricity um, so that it has a reduced greenhouse gas impact because they're converting methane into carbon dioxide, whereas otherwise it would just be methane that went into the atmosphere, which is 21 times more potent than just carbon dioxide alone as a greenhouse gas. So, yeah, if you, if you treat your own manure from your own herd or buy your milk from an environmentally aware dairy, usually the organic or biodynamic uh, dairies uh, get rid of the animal waste uh, responsibly uh, and compost it usually or um, get rid of it in methane. So it, it absolutely does depend on where you source your milk from. Um, now, I've done a little bit of research about the the companies that I buy milk from, and yes, indeed, they do 
handle their waste responsibly by producing electricity from it. So that's a good thing. Um, and the transportation costs are a lot less uh, if you purchase your product locally. There are a couple of the environmental benefits that I can think of off the top of my head uh, from the research that I've done. Um, but like I said, uh, if you own your own animal, then you're probably more inclined to make uh, cheese from all that excess milk, and you're more inclined to have a less impact uh, on the environment uh, with that single or um, or a couple of animals. And not only are they uh, great at mowing your lawn, <laughs> uh, they, uh, they provide wonderful compost or manure for your compost heap and your veggie patch and your fruit trees and all that sort of stuff. There's nothing... And I'm afraid, Kylie, there's nothing hard and fast around around home cheese making and, and why why it would be better for the environment. But like I said, there's some off the top of my head and I'll stop rambling now. But anyway, thanks for your question. And the next question's from Deb. And Deb says, uh, Hi, Gavin, I've been making some cheeses from your book and I've had good results with cream cheese and mozzarella. I just tried feta and the cheese looks great but is really too salty to enjoy. Have I done something wrong? I made up the brine with two litres of water, 500 grams of salt, plus one tablespoon each of vinegar and calcium chloride. The brine was cold, the brine was cold when I added the cheese and kept it in the fridge for two days, turned once. I've now split the cheese into two and stored it in small containers with a little brine. I have read that you can soak the cheese in milk to reduce the saltiness, but I'd like to get it right for next time. Thanks so much and keep up the good work, Deb. Well, thanks for your question, Deb. Um, you did follow the recipe to the T because normally traditional Greek feta is soaked in a 26% brine solution, which is fully saturated. Um, that's what I added in the recipe in the book. However, for the home cheese maker, you probably don't like that massive hit of salt um, so what you can do you can adjust it down to a safe level which is around 18 percent and 18 percent is the level where uh, harmful bacteria will not grow in your brine so it will also give you a milder taste so you did the right thing milk does indeed um, take some of the salt out of your cheese and, and it does um, it does make it more uh, readily edible um, so if you do over-salt your cheese, soak a little bit in milk and, and that'll get rid of it, especially feta. Um, but for reference for uh, everybody out there, I recorded a podcast episode and in the show notes I placed a table that I found somewhere on the interwebs around how to determine how many percent of um, brine, what, what the brine salt levels are for your brine. Uh, that's episode 21 um, of the podcast. I'll pop that in the show notes as well. Now, Deb did uh, reply back. Um, she said she's going to experiment with the brine concentration next time. And she did indeed soak the feta in some milk and it brought the salty taste down. And she can really appreciate the, the lovely flavour of the feta. Okay, uh, the next question I have is from Jeffrey Rosenberg. Uh, Jeffrey says, I have a quick question about making sherv. Uh, sherv is a, a goat's milk cheese. Uh, I do it often from the culture from cheesemaking.com. It always turns out good and tasty. I use the same raw goat's milk consistently. Sometimes my cheese is rather dry and crumbly. At other times it is smooth and creamy, like a dense cream cheese. Any ideas what might be causing the difference? I think it is not related to the draining when I hang the cheese in the cheesecloth. Well, I've got a couple of suggestions. And not all milk is equal throughout the, the year. The fat content of any animal uh, varies over the year. Uh, during spring, when um, when animals are on grass, uh, fresh grass, and during the summer, uh, they have a lot more fat content in their milk. If they're just on um, on hay and silage, then the fat content is going to be lower. So that's one suggestion. Um, it will depend on the fat content of the milk um, if you're using it from the same goat. Uh, another one would be... I would say, well, you don't cut curds in sherv, so it couldn't be the curd size. Uh, but the other thing I would think could be 
the amount of enzymes in the raw goat's milk, which are hard to determine. If you've got, if the goat has a lot of lipase in the uh, goat's milk, that tends to make it a little bit more, um, a little bit more smooth and creamier. Um, and also the age of your rennet also determines whether it will dry the cheese out or more whey gets excluded, uh, ex- exudes from the, um, from the curds. So there's a few thoughts. Um, I definitely would think it's probably the fat content of the milk um, if he's using the same animal over and over. Anyway, thanks very much, Jeffrey. So the next question is from Wayne. And Wayne says, uh, I answered Wayne's question in the uh, last podcast. And he says, uh, he's got another question. (laughs) He says, do you keep the blue cheese sealed in the box for its entire maturation or do you allow it to air a little bit later on? Um, I have a plan to try another using your wrapping suggestion. My original suggestion was to wrap it in tinfoil, the the outside part and leave the ends exposed where the uh, the holes where he's poked the holes to uh, to let the blue veins develop. Uh, and to answer your question, Wayne, uh, you, I, I normally leave it in the maturation box for most of its life because you're constantly scraping off um, any excess mould that grows, um, so it doesn't become too runny in the middle. Probably the last two or three weeks, maybe four, um, I would wrap it in in cheese paper. There's a there's a paper you can buy that you can wrap camembert, other mould ripened cheeses. Uh, you can wrap your blue cheese in that, and that slows down and takes away some of the air. Um, because remember that the uh, Penicillium Roque 40 thrives on oxygen, and that's what it multi- That's how it multiplies. Obviously, it uses the cheese. Uh, as a base, um, but it uses oxygen to multiply. So you want to slow that down a little bit. You can wrap it in in cheese wrap, and that'll uh, take too much of the kick out of it. You don't want your blue cheese to be too overpowering unless that's what you like, so don't wrap it at all. So there's a few suggestions, and hopefully that answers your question, Wayne. Okay, we've come to the end of the show. Before I do the normal um, closing... I'd just like to um, bring your attention. I do have another podcast and I do have another blog. So the blog's called The Greening of Gavin and it's about sustainable living in the suburbs. And this this blog may interest some of you um, if you're trying to live a, a little bit greener or, or trying to live a little bit um, uh, more sustainably. And I, I particularly focus the blog and the podcast, which is the same name. Um, You'll see a link to it if you go to the blog. It's of particular interest to uh, people who want to live a more sustainable lifestyle, and it's it's particularly aimed at suburban living. There are a lot of suburbs, and we're not going to be able to bulldoze them and make anything um, wonderful out of them um, once they start getting past their use-by date. So what I've done here is retrofitted um, my home um, to make it as comfortable as possible. Uh, and I'm actually adding some more insulation soon to the, the fabric of the house. Um, but what I've done is is try to produce as much food uh, as I possibly can on my um, 779 square metre home. Um, so I grow a lot of organic produce. And we've got some chickens as well. And also on our uh, block here, we've got 27 uh, fruit trees, uh, some in pots and uh, some in the ground, a lot in the ground. Um, and they provide us with all of our fruit for the the year and any excess we have, we preserve. So that's what I write about in my spare time when I'm not making cheese. So you can find that blog and podcast over at greeningofgavin.com and you'll see the, the link to the podcast there as well. And that's produced once a week, uh, very similar to the Little Green Cheese podcast. So a little bit of cross promotion there. I'm I'm not ashamed to do that, <laughs> because um, yeah, for for a lot of cheesemakers, they do try and live a more sustainable lifestyle. So uh, pop on over there if you, if you wish to have a look. Now don't forget that um, if you like this podcast, that you can help it come up in the charts so that other cheesemakers can find it. Uh, if you pop over to iTunes, you can leave a a, a rating. 
so a star rating and a review. Uh, leave an honest review. Um, I don't mind if it's not five star. It can be whatever you, you think it is. And, uh, and just leave a little note there um, saying why you like it or why you don't like it. You've been listening to The Little Green Cheese. For upcoming workshop dates, you can find those over on littlegreencheese.com. Over there you can also find all my recipes, and if you want them all together in one place, you can find them in my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. That's available in all ebook formats and at all good ebook retailers. You can also find my cheese making video tutorials within that book or on my YouTube channel. Just search for the username Greening of Gavin. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop and Call to the Dairy Cows. <laughs>